My view is that ultimately we will get an Ethereum ETF. The, the core logic on which the Bitcoin ETF approval rests, which is that futures and spot track each other very well and are tightly correlated. So I think we'll eventually get it. I would guess I'm over 50% by the end of this year. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. And today we're exploring the frontier of ETFs, specifically the Bitcoin ETF and the Ethereum ETF. We have Matt Hogan and Ryan Rasmussen from Bitwise to help us out with that. A few things we talk about today. Number one, the Bitcoin ETF. Was it a success? How successful was it in the grand scheme of things? And why Matt and Ryan still think there's a lot of juice to squeeze out of the Bitcoin ETF. Number two, flipping in gold. Why not only is the Bitcoin ETF flipping in gold in line of sight, uh, maybe we go far beyond that, potentially 3x or more beyond that. Number three, the Ethereum ETF. Is it coming this year? What are their honest predictions? This is by far the best analysis I've heard yet. And number four, what's next for the institutions after the Ethereum ETF, after the Bitcoin ETF? Where do we go from there? There's so much to unpack in this episode, especially with the conversation around the Ethereum ETF, which has been going around in the crypto Twitter verse. A lot of the conversations and just uh, around Ethereum these days is about the ETF. First, before we get into this conversation with Matt and Ryan, get this podcast on the premium RSS feed where you get every single Bankless podcast without the ads and all the bonus episodes that you don't get if you're listening to the free RSS feed, which you are if you're hearing this. If you're listening to Bankless on Spotify, you can sign up for the premium RSS feed directly inside of the Spotify app and you get all the other perks of being a Bankless citizen, of which there are too many to mention here. You can use code PODCAST24 to get 10% off of this subscription forever, but this code expires at the end of March. So go do it right now. Lately in the ETF conversation, there has been discussion about the decreasing likelihood of the Ethereum ETF approval at the end of May, where the first deadline is up. Uh, after going through the gamut that is the Bitcoin ETF conversation, of which there is plenty to talk about, and we do unpack all of that conversation, we get into the Ethereum ETF conversation. And the crypto industry really has just a, a, always a perpetual short-term focus because of how fast things move in the crypto industry. And so thinking in like, multiple quarters is generally not what we do, but Matt and Ryan and generally people speaking all understand that the Ethereum ETF is going to get approved. Uh, it's not a matter of if, if, it's a matter of when. And so we ask some, some of the questions about that approval. Of course, we start asking by when, but then we ask them about further things like what about staking inside of the ETH ETF? Uh, how much demand is there? Will there be for the ETH ETF? Uh, and how are they positioning the ETH ETF to their broader clients? Matt is coming to us from Digital Asset Summit over in London, where he's talking to all of TradFi and about what their interests are. Uh, and uh, he's got a lot of alpha to share here on the podcast today. So we're going to get right into all of that information. But first, I want to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible, especially the place where you can still front run the opportunity with Bitcoin and ETH and all the other tokens that you can buy on Kraken, our preferred exchange for crypto in 2024. If you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the links in the show notes and getting started with Kraken today. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Celo is the mobile-first EVM-compatible carbon negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a layer two. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo layer two to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo layer two will bring huge advantages like a decentralized 
decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter, and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Back this nation, we have two esteemed guests from Bitwise today. Matt Hogan is the chief investment officer at Bitwise, and Ryan Rasmussen <laughs> is a senior analyst at Bitwise. Matt, Ryan, it's great to have you on Bankless. Great to be here. Okay, so Bitwise, for, for context, we've had Matt on before, is an asset management firm, and uh, you guys have your own Bitcoin ETF. It's called BitB, uh, B-I-T-B. So four letters there. It's got two billion in assets under management. So congrats on that. And uh, Bitwise is probably one of our favorite uh, Bitcoin ETFs. If we're allowed to have favorite, I don't know because we've known we Matt and Bitwise for a yeah. while. They're crypto natives. They understand the space. They understand this in industry. And so uh, we want to ask you guys a few questions about ETF world, about institutional adoption, and uh, everything that's going on there. It's, does that sound good? I love it. Yeah, appreciate the support. All right. So first question here is, uh, how are the Bitcoin ETFs going? Just give us the lay of the land. We are what, like just over 60 days in, uh, you know, like a few more than that. How, how's it going so far? I'll start and uh, and Rasmussen can jump in. This launch has exceeded everyone's expectations, right? For context, I spent 15 years in the ETF industry before I moved into crypto uh, full time six and a half years ago. These are the largest ETF launches ever by a significant factor. To put it in context, before these ETFs, the fastest growing ETF for one year in flows, in other words, how much people invested in the first year, were the NASDAQ 100 Qs, QQQ, and those pulled in $5 billion in a year. And if you take these new Bitcoin ETFs, even after you subtract the outflows from GBTC, they've pulled in $12 billion in two months. So by far and away, the fastest growing ETFs of all time. I was very optimistic. I spent you know, three years with the team at Bitwise or five years trying to get one of these launched. And I didn't expect anything like this. We're at 2 billion, the ecosystems you know, pulled in 12. It's just been outrageously great. And I think it will accelerate in the future. So after maybe a few weeks, a few months, maybe a month or so now, where it may be a little bit quiet, I think there's a second acceleration coming that, that may even dwarf this first one. So uh, it's good time in ETF land. Well, if you think these first two months of the Bitcoin ETFs have been quiet, I can't wait to see what a future acceleration looks like because it doesn't look like it's been quiet from, from my perspective. It seems like it's been quite loud. Uh, I want to ask just about like how the success of these Bitcoin ETFs has uh, characterized the industry from the outside perspective. So like we, there were two potential worlds going into the approval of the Bitcoin ETF. They were, there was the uh, flop and then there was the massive success. And we are in the universe in which we got the massive success. Uh, how has that changed the PR, the optics, uh, the position of the crypto industry to the perspective of the outsiders? I'll go ahead and take this one. I think that this has been a massive boon for the industry. I think you hear a lot of stories from whether it's grandparents or aunts or uncles or, or parents or siblings who now with these Bitcoin ETFs, look at that as a stamp of approval from not only the government, but just the mainstream America. You have these big investors going on CNBC, Larry Fink and others that are really well known talking about Bitcoin as an asset class rather than a speculative vehicle or something that like vaporware that's going to you know go away in a few years. And I think that just shows what these ETFs have done in a very short amount of time. And in two months, we've gone from and hey, crypto is a scam to, oh, this is a legitimate asset class that could overtake other commodities at some point like gold. And so that just kind of shows where we're at. And I know the conversations that I'm having on the road with our sales team at conferences with advisors are way different today than they were one year ago or two years ago. And without the ETFs, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. So it's been a huge boost for the for the asset class. Matt, you, yeah. you called this an overwhelming success. Um, was Was Wall Street surprised by this? I think Wall Street was surprised. I think people thought it would be a success, right? We knew there was demand, but the scale of the success and the broad-based nature of it, I think has exceeded expectations. And I think it gets to something that Ryan mentioned, which is what really changed from traditional finances view is they now accept that Bitcoin is going to be here forever. Uh, once we have these ETFs, once BlackRock and Invesco and these giant names are in there, once you know, RAs, investment advisors, institutions are piling in, 
they've accepted that Bitcoin won't go away. So I, I think, you know, we knew it was going to be a success, but the scale is just, it's just off the charts. Uh, you, you mentioned, Matt, this uh, second acceleration, right? So uh, we've seen the first acceleration that got us to 12 billion. And yep. uh, the second acceleration, can you describe what that actually is? Why, why would we be getting a second acceleration? Uh, you know, like if you're looking at this from the outside, you might say, well, you know, the first wave, everyone who wanted to buy, they probably already bought. And certainly now the Bitcoin ETF is, is hyped enough. We're squarely in a, in a bull cycle. So why would there be any second acceleration? Yeah, great, great question. I can I can start it and, and Ryan can finish. Um, the thing about ETFs approval is it unlocks only a portion of the market. So the day an ETF is approved by the SEC, retail investors can buy it and independent financial advisors, people who manage money on behalf of other people can buy it. But there's a whole class of investors who still can't buy it. So the largest wealth management platforms in the US are firms like Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, Wells Fargo. These have tens of thousands of advisors and trillions of dollars of assets. And they can't buy it on those platforms until they complete their own due diligence. So it's not good enough that the SEC approved it. Each of those platforms has a due diligence process and they have to approve the ETF as well. And that process hasn't happened yet. That will probably start to happen in the next few weeks or the next few months. I would say that maybe 30% of the wealth market in the US can now access these ETFs, but there's a whole additional 70% that's going to come online, not all at once, not like the ETF launch. This will be a series of individual approvals at each of these firms and each of these sort of tiers of wealth mm -hmm. until we get to the final opening. I'll make an analogy um, that maybe, maybe makes sense to people. The closest analogy to the Bitcoin ETF launch was the gold ETF launch. And the gold ETF launch was a very big deal and suddenly people could buy gold, but inflows built over seven years, right? Before they reached a local maximum. And actually the largest year was year 16. So what we've seen now is retail investors and independent advisors buy these ETFs, hedge funds, venture capital funds. It's great, huge success, but there's this whole other level that we're about to get to in the next month or two months or three months that, um, that's really where the trillions of dollars and that uh, is that Matt lies. is that what we're seeing when we see like Morgan Stanley has kind of opened the gates to the Bitcoin Wells Fargo has opened the gates to the Bitcoin ETF I like all of these gates I didn't even know these things existed but is that basically <laughs> the process of this this second uh acceleration here that's exactly right yeah it's it's like a nuclear key right you need the SEC to turn it and then you need Morgan Stanley to turn it and we're just going through that process of the second key turning I would give one additional data point here. So I spent eight years before I joined Bitwise working at a company called Satera Financial Group. This is a large network of independent financial advisors. They have 10,000 advisors or more. They manage 300 billion in assets. And they just recently approved Bitcoin ETFs on their platform for those 10,000 plus advisors to start allocating on behalf of their clients. And that took two months. And like I said, I've been in an org that organization before and organizations, organizations like that. And the wheels just move very slowly. There's so many executives and teams involved in reviewing what is Bitcoin? Are we okay with our advisors allocating to it? How do we feel about them getting exposure on behalf of clients? Then once they make that decision, they have to evaluate the different vehicles. They have to decide how they're going to educate their the advisors on what Bitcoin is and what it means to put Bitcoin in portfolio. A lot of time, those advisors have to educate their clients before they actually make that investment. And so there's all these different hurdles that you have to clear before you actually make the allocation. It isn't just the platform approval. There's a whole education process that happens after that. And I think you know on the retail side, we move a lot quicker because we're self-directing our own investments. But when you have someone managing money on behalf of another, there's a lot more hoops you have to jump through to make sure you're complying with all of the regulatory uh, requirements and whatnot. And so I think that's partly what takes so long. Yeah, this is certainly probably th um, things that are moving on timeframes that crypto natives, the crypto industry doesn't really consider uh, because we are so short term focused in this industry. But really, the, the Bitcoin ETFs and general ETFs uh, broadly are just like a, a fine wine kind of thing. Like you got to let them age before they really uh, they really uh, mature. Uh, Matt, I, I just want to try and get some more numbers on this thing. You, you said 30 and 70 percent uh, in terms of like 30 percent of capital is available. And just want to make sure that I'm under, understanding that, that uh, correctly. You, the, when in, in terms of the acceleration that you were referencing, uh, the 30, 70 percent is like total available like pools of capital, as in like the 30 percent is the available and interested capital. And that acceleration that you're talking about is like there's 
roughly 70% more capital uh, available to be uh, to buy the Bitcoin ETF as the BTC ETF ages. Can you just shed a little bit more light on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a that's a back of the envelope calculation, but that's around right. If you look at the U.S. wealth management industry, people have different measures of how big it is, but let's call it, you know, 40 to 50 trillion dollars somewhere in that zone. Yeah, I think about, a, you know, 30 percent of that can access these ETFs today, which is great. Like that's trillions of dollars that can access these ETFs and it's turned into billions of dollars of flows. And th th those flows are just getting started. But there is this whole other group that hasn't even crossed the chasm into being able to access that. It's probably, it's certainly the larger contingent. So the majority of wealth, whether it's 60 or 70% of the wealth that's still waiting and they're doing their due diligence. They're actually moving faster on these Bitcoin ETFs than they do on most ETFs. Usually this would be a six month or year long process and it's, it's gonna be a quarter long process or a four month long process. So it's great. But as you said, that's that's sort of glacial from a crypto perspective. Uh, but they will get there. The the progress is happening. They're they're going to approve them, and uh, we'll start to feel those flows build over months and quarters and years. I, I will say one of my favorite parts of this whole story, the whole crypto story, and what's happening with Wall Street sort of discovering crypto is something we say at the beginning of every single Bankless podcast. This is an opportunity to front run the opportunity, right? And this is like. Bankless listeners will know we are fans of the crypto natives, the, the believers, uh, kind of the underdogs, you know, like retail over institutions uh, wherever possible. And um, retail has had a solid decade to front run uh, Bitcoin price appreciation. And even now, there's still time for retail in their 401ks, for instance, their IRAs, to get ahead of that 70% that still has no access to capital. And I'll juxtapose this with basically... Uh, almost all, 99% of the opportunities that that you sort of see uh, for investment opportunities where uh, institutions have an edge. If a company is going to IPO, first of all, all the VCs get in first and you have to be an accredited investor and all of that rigmarole. And, and then, uh, you know, the, um, the the banks that are issuing the, the the stock, they get their cut ahead of time too. They get preference. And by the time the thing is IPO'd, right, it's like all of the all of the juice has been squeezed out of it on the institutional side. And what's retail left with, which is like, you know, Facebook stock that's already done its 10,000 X appreciation and you just get a measly like, you know, five to 10 X after that. Uh, and just like, thank you very much. Crypto is the exact opposite of that. And that is one of the things I've been most uh, excited about uh, for every single, every single moment of, of joining. Retail, the small guy gets first dibs on this, the believer, the person who's using it. Uh, and then institutions are left to kind of like, uh, Come, come, uh, buy our buy bags. Bag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't yeah. phrase it like that, Matt. <laughs> no, but I think that's exactly right. I mean, this is an empowering technology and uh, institutional capital has so many sort of behavioral biases against it, you know, inherently anti-tech, inherently disruptive, uh, difficulty getting their heads around digital things. This was one of the few places where retail had advantages and has taken advantage of it. And kudos to them. Like kudos to everyone who was early and has been in this for years through bull and bear markets. Kudos to everyone, as you mentioned, still getting in now because um, you know, it's it's not it's not the end. It may be the end of the beginning, but we're not quite there yet. There still is a little bit of time, even on Bitcoin, much less on ETH, um, uh, which you know I'm sure we'll get to. But um, but yeah, I I love that about crypto as well. It's 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 really a beautiful thing. It warms my heart. We've got a, a two-part question for you, Matt. Um, that I was just looking for some like timelines on that seventy percent. Is this like uh, that seventy percent will be accessed by the end of this year, end of twenty twenty-four, or is it even longer than that? And then zooming into the fullness of time, like once this like acceleration phase is over and we strike some equilibrium with flows, like I don't want the bankless listeners to like perceive that oh like oh the fun is over, uh, like there the, in the old world of the stock market. Uh, like there is constant flows into people's just like 401ks into QQQ into SPY. And so like these indices and even just like the general stock market is up only because there's persistent flows into them. And this is 
where Bitcoin is going. This is where the, the Bitcoin ETF is going. Any sort of crypto asset with an ETF gets access to this flows. And that's the new equilibrium. And so the, the two part question is like what, this acceleration period, what's the timeline on that? And then once that closes, what is what does the final equilibrium of flows into the Bitcoin ETF look like? Yeah, great questions. I think it's a let's say it's a year long process evenly distributed with unlocks along the way at each phase of that it may be till the end of 2025 it may be an 18 month process and a little bit gets unlocked every time it's not like the shotgun start of the etf launch which was the sec said go these are you know probably 50 individual decisions that each unlock a little bit of this additional pie some more important than others but it will it will take some time i think the point you made about uh, one difference of these TradFi markets, they're probably actually two. Uh, one, you mentioned continual investment, which is absolutely true. What we're seeing at Bitwise is people putting these ETFs into models. And what that means is they have a sort of theoretical allocation to stocks, bonds, real estate, and now a little bit of crypto that they put all of their investors into. And as they save money for retirement, as they save money in taxable accounts, a little bit goes in on a continual basis. The flip side of that is a lot of these people rebalance, which is if crypto goes up a very lot, they may sell a little bit to bring it back down to that target weight. I think the, the effect of this will be sort of uh, upward push on crypto prices long term sustainable upward push because it's a, a continual flow of capital as you mentioned that's why stocks are you know up only over long periods of time and a diminution in volatility i don't mean that crypto is going to be boring i just mean it will be less volatile than it was in the past because you'll have people who invest a little bit every month you'll have people who systematically sort of buy low and sell high because they're rebalancing and so you should see volatility compress a little bit over time, which it already has been. Um, but it's hugely positive for crypto. Persistent inflows that will, you know, match or overwhelm supply, I think is what you should expect. Um, and uh, and I just think you, you should expect that to build over multiple years. Like, I don't think 2024 will be the peak year for Bitcoin ETF flows. I think that'll be many years out. I think it's going to build over time. I, I think there's this idea, Matt, you, you said earlier that, um, well, crypt, crypto, Bitcoin's not going away, right? Anytime soon, there's this realization. Uh, I, I think um, there's also this this realization that, um, you know, crypto is now has to be part of a portfolio. I think I saw this was um, Fidelity Canada, by the way, not Fidelity US yet, but you can imagine it coming. Now, you know, they have their default growth funds, right? You know, the, the, the typical 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% uh, you know, bonds, if you're, if you're doing something high growth, uh, for instance, well, now it's like 60, 43, or it's like, you know, it's not 60, 40, obviously, you know, that, that's 103%, <laughs> but, uh, we've got like 3% allocated to crypto by default. So we're starting yeah. to this move to this world where not only is crypto not going anywhere, it's part of a default portfolio construction. And that is, I think the world that, uh, that you were describing here. That's absolutely right. And it's a it's a complete game changer. But, you know, it aligns with sort of the most conservative, stayed, pinstripe suit, dyed in the wool investing methodology, like sort of the Jack Bogle Vanguard methodology to evoke a firm that is now very much disliked by crypto. But their view is that your starting point is you should own everything. You should own every stock. You should own every bond. You should be just invested in the global economy because it grows every year. Just own everything. And from that perspective, you have to own crypto. If you don't own crypto, you're actually short crypto versus your global benchmark of asset allocation. And so what that 3% in a model portfolio tells you is that's sort of the baseline. If you're below that, then you're making an active bet that crypto is not going to matter in the future. Most people don't wanna do that. They just wanna own the market. And it's a complete game changer. I mean, you know, like I save for my kids' college education every month X dollars. And there's no crypto in that exposure yet because the products don't exist, but I suspect that will change in the next couple of years. And that means everyone who's a parent will be 
you know, saving X dollars every month for their children and a little bit will go into crypto. I think that's the world so that we're wild. moving into. Crypto right? will help us pay for uh, our, our the rising cost of education. That's, I mean, but yeah. like the, you're, you're talking about the truth here. Just a quick side quest though, Matt, since you invoked the name of Vanguard and and, and the Bogleheads. <laughs> okay, so CEO of Vanguard has says no Bitcoin. We're not doing yeah. that. Double down multiple times, it seems like. Why? Can you explain that? Uh, anchoring bias, you know, a desire to seem conservative. Vanguard also said no ETFs, right? Jack Bogle was famous for hating ETFs. They th he thought he tempted shareholders to trade too much and destroy themselves. And they stayed out of the ETF game for the long time. Now it's their largest area of the market. Vanguard will come over as well. Look at BlackRock. Larry Fink called Bitcoin an index of money laundering. Mm -hmm. And Did then he really? It, when was this? Yeah. 2017, an, an index of money laundering. And then to his enormous credit, I mean, really his enormous credit, we compete with them, but to his enormous credit, he studied it, talked to smart people, changed his mind and developed a team to integrate Bitcoin into BlackRock. So I, I think Vanguard will eventually be here, just like they eventually became a large ETF issuer. And everyone gets the Bitcoin price they deserve. And, and apparently uh, the CEO of Vanguard deserves <laughs> a higher line. price. I will never get tired <laughs> of that line, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Bitwise Ryan, I want to ask you about like, through your travels and conversations with just uh, these buyers of the Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, who are they? I'm sure there's like the regular cast of characters that I could also guess, but are there also any like surprises in there? Like, uh, and what kind of like data do we actually have to, to talk about? Like, who are the actual buyers of the Bitcoin ETF? Yeah, that's a good question. So so we go on the road, we have a sales team, about 25 people that go around every day. They're they're meeting with financial advisors or RAs at their offices or at steak dinners or at lunches. And so on the research team, we travel with them sometimes. Recently, I was in Denver, ahead of Eat Denver with our sales rep out there. And we went into a large RA. They managed 350 million in assets. And we, we catered some sushi lunch. We sat down with them and then we did a, a Bitcoin 101 presentation. What is Bitcoin? How does it work? What is mining? How does Bitcoin fit in a portfolio? And you, you can just walk them from the very beginning through where we're at today, why Bitcoin ETFs exist, why those are a big deal. And then what you see in the room is a wide variety of people, some that are crypto interested. There's generally one or two people in a room of 10 or 12. That's a diehard crypto fanatic. They own it in their portfolio. They start asking about NFTs and like go down a rabbit hole. And then you see some other people on the other side of the spectrum that uh, are, are likely too afraid to ask questions because in a room of their colleagues that are supposed to be, you know, well-versed financial professionals, maybe they haven't taken the time to study Bitcoin and crypto, and they don't want to seem like they don't know what they're talking about. And so it's really a wide variety. But those one or two people that are crypto fanatics in the firm is what allows us to get our foot in the door. And then from there, it's just an educational journey. And, and I would say that those individuals that that are into crypto, they're probably advocating for three to 5% of portfolios to be invested in Bitcoin or invested in a crypto index. And then you have the skeptics who think 1% is outrageous. And that's where we show them the models and the portfolio simulations that say, look, if you have 3% or 5% or even 10%, that can add a lot of risk adjusted returns to your portfolio while barely increasing volatility. And I think once you show them that kind of data, you really start to see their eyes opening, especially the people that were more uh, more averse to adding Bitcoin to a portfolio going into the conversation, you start to see their eyes opening and they see the, the sharp ratios, the risk adjusted returns, and they start to realize, oh, this is a real asset that can really boost a diversified portfolio versus add unwanted risk and unwanted volatility. And that's when they start to come around to adding it into their client portfolios. Just out of uh, curiosity, is there any just like comparative conversation being made about gold ETFs? And just like what, what, how has the PR around gold as a commodity changed now that Bitcoin is like the sparkly new digital gold uh, that's also got an ETF? Like, what, what are people saying about gold these days? I get the same critique when we when we try to make the comparison of Bitcoin to gold. I think you often have similar to have you have like a you have a Bitcoin bug in the room, you have a gold bug in the room, and they try to argue all kinds of things like it's been around for a thousand years, it's ten percent of it's used in electricity, electric uh, or, or in electronics, and so. Uh, you have to kind of fight that narrative. But we ran a really interesting simulation at the beginning of this year. We said, instead of adding 5% of Bitcoin to your portfolio, to a traditional 60-40 portfolio, what if you added 5% of gold? And the impact that gold has on a portfolio is actually negligible. It doesn't do anything for your portfolio. It doesn't add any, any risk-adjusted returns. It doesn't increase volatility, but yet it doesn't boost returns. And so we start to show that kind of data that says, look, I understand that you, you like gold. We understand that you may be allocating to gold. 
But if you just take a small portion of that, maybe 50% of your 3% gold allocation or 50% of your 1% gold allocation, and you shift that over into Bitcoin, the impact it has on the potential for, for returns without really impacting the downside is really hard to ignore. And they almost have a fiduciary responsibility to listen to that argument and to look into it because they really have to do what's best for their clients. So that's certainly what we're seeing. Definitely seeing outflows from gold into Bitcoin as they think about what part of their portfolio and their alt sleeve they're carving off as they're investing in Bitcoin as well. Yeah, and I I just add two things on top of that. Um, we're seeing some advisors have an inflation bucket or a US government debasement bucket that's 50% gold and 50% Bitcoin, which I think is great, right? That's fine. That's an easier sell to their clients. We're worried about a government printing trillions of dollars of debt every few months. Let's hedge it. Who knows how it's gonna work best? I think that's fine. The other narrative change, which I find really interesting, is for the, the last five years, um, mostly you could talk to advisors about Bitcoin taking a percentage of the gold market, 10% of the gold market, 20% of the gold market, 50% of the gold market. Increasingly, I find you can convince them that it may be multiples of the gold market, that Bitcoin is everything that gold is, plus the ability to teleport it around the world. And that has more applications. So is it 2x the gold market? Is it 3x the gold market? And I think that's an interesting change. So you, you couldn't really get that across to people uh, before the Bitcoin ETF. Now, I think you can. You can start to talk about multiples instead of percentages. And um, I think that's pretty exciting. I think uh, inside of the crypto industry, we're all uh, pretty good at thinking in um, uh, parabolas much more than the, the TradFi community. And so when we see the gold market cap uh, gold being the number one asset by market cap and Bitcoin as like number nine, number 10. As crypto natives, we're like, oh, we could dethrone gold. And which is probably like unheard of to, to like TradFi, just like in the, in the, uh, in the, their first like gut reaction. Uh, but like right now, I think the, the next milestone on this is like the Bitcoin ETF, uh, AUM flipping the gold ETFs AUM. I actually don't know where we stand on this current race, but like also in crypto world, we are used to using this word, world call, word called the flippening. Uh, so like when, uh, which I'm guessing is just inevitable, when the Bitcoin ETF does flip the gold ETF, is this like a big deal or is this more of a milestone for funsies that us crypto natives talk about? Like how will that change the conversation in, in the, uh, the uh, traditional finance world? Oh, I love that. I think the flipping will happen next year. And I do think it's a big deal because ETFs are how investors today express their preferences for what to allocate to. And what that will signal is that more of them want to allocate to Bitcoin, that, you know, nostalgia is not an investment strategy and gold is in the past. Um, so I think that will be an important moment. And I suspect it could happen as early as next year. How close are uh, we, Matt? And how, do, how does where, that where even do happen? We stand? Well, we have about, what, $50 billion plus in the Bitcoin ETFs, um, you know, inclusive of GBTC. I think gold is is north of 100 if you add them all up together or right around 100. So, so we only we need, need a 2x. 2X. And that's price we'll do that and this inflows. Year. There you go. Exactly. We'll do that this year. We'll do that before Q2. <laughs> Let's flip it. And, and Let's Q3, flip it. excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to happen. I think it's inevitable. As Ryan mentioned, Bitcoin is just so much more valuable in a portfolio context than gold has been historically, um, not to mention it has sort of better underlying sort of fundamental growth patterns. But yeah, we might flip it this year. I love it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle.
Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax obligations for providing token grants to your team? It's no secret that token management gets complicated. Between learning all the legal language and tax obligations in every country that your team is in, token grant management can feel like an obstacle course, but it doesn't have to. That's where Toku steps in. Toku provides practical tools to handle token grants, allowing for effective oversight of token distributions and payroll tax compliance for employees, contractors, advisors, and investors. They also handle tax withholding through their real-time tax calculations that can be done by Toku or integrated into any payroll EOR providers in any jurisdiction. Toku is a trusted provider of Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Protocol, and many more. Get started for free and make token compensation simple at toku.com slash bankless. I know uh, Bitcoin is not the only crypto asset that um, you, you guys at Bitwise find uh, interesting or valuable. In fact, I think, Matt, we've had you on the, the podcast before. We were talking about how to um, talk to RIAs and institutions about DeFi, decentralized finance, and some of the tokens surrounding it, these new cash flowing assets that are not not stocks, but something different, uh, you know, protocol network assets, something like this. Uh, so let's talk about the next set of assets that we think we can create an ETF wrapper around, like a, a trad ERC-20, as, uh, as, as we call it sometimes <laughs> on Bankless. So um, the next one in line feels like it needs to be, it should be, the Ethereum ETF. And I, I, I'm coming from the perspective that um, nothing else is close to that at this point in time. We don't yet have futures for any other ETF. So the next in line, apart from Bitcoin, would be uh, the Ethereum ETF. And I want to get your take on uh, when that's going to happen. Could it happen this year? There's been a lot of conversation about this recently. So uh, some of the B Bloomberg analysts who we've had on the podcast before recently came back and they, they said by May, low probability, something like 30%. I uh, saw uh, Jake Travinsky and others kind of like weigh in on this as well. They think that it will be politically very difficult, probably untenable for uh Chair Gensler to do this in, with the current kind of administrative uh, setup and some of the political pressures he feels. Let's remember, Gensler is kind of like the third vote mm -hmm. of five. Uh, he he was the one that that got majority for the Bitcoin ETF across the finish line. I know I, I'm pretty sure you guys have a filing in. Is that correct? And so you you don't yet. We do not yet. Oh, no, we do not, not yet. yet. Okay, is, not that, yet. is, is that something you want to announce, yeah. Matt, on the, on the podcast today? <laughs> <laughs> how, how much no, work is that yet we're doing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that yet work is doing a lot of a lot of work. I mean, we've talked about it in the past. We we intend to have an Ethereum uh, ETF filing when we think it can be approved, and we're really excited about Ethereum. We 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 love the asset as as we've discussed, Ryan. I think for many in TradFi, it's easier to get their hands around ETH and the cash flow generating nature um, of ETH and the real world use applications that are being built uh, on the Ethereum network. I think that's easier for many people to understand. So we absolutely intend to be in this space. The good thing about not having a filing is I can talk about it. Oh, uh, so if I had a filing, I, I couldn't so actually So we have say some anything. freedom before you file. You, when, once you file, you'll have a little bit uh, like more clothes. Yeah, clothes, zipper, zipper but, but now it's more open. That is, that's exactly right. Yeah. Once you right, file. Because I've the, got some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. it. Let's go. Let's okay. Go. So the, the recent meta has been uh, a decreasing in the probability of the approval of the ETH ETF in May. I think there was something previously like 60 to 70 percent uh, sometime late last year, early this year. Now that has uh, decreased. You can see this in the poly market. Uh, the, the ETF bros, um, Eric and, and James, have also decreased their probability down to 35 percent. Maybe without any sort of question in specific, just like comment on that. Comment on like the likelihood of the ETH approval happening like in this year, for example. Yeah, sure. So I can start, Ryan, you can jump in afterwards to set up. The reason people talk about May is because ETF filings uh, for crypto ETFs move on a 240 day review cycle. And so by the 240th day, the SEC has to say yes or no. And the first of those days ends up in May. The so, reason so you're May would not end up in a delay. It would end up in either an approval or a denial, correct? That's correct. Yeah, they okay. can't kick the can down the road after May. Um, uh, and and that's it's it's a great part of the process because they have to say yes or no. The reason you're seeing the odds decrease is because Eric and others are reading the tea leaves. What are the tea leaves? Usually, when you get to this point in the process, if you're going to get an approval, 
you're having direct engagement with the SEC where they're asking you a bunch of questions and then you're updating your prospectus to reflect those changes. So they'll ask you like 40 or 50 or 60 questions. And if you look back at the Bitcoin ETF approvals, what you started to see was Amendment 2 to our prospectus, Amendment 3 to our prospectus, Amendment 4, Amendment 5. Between those amendments, there's this back and forth with the SEC. And I think the reason they're downrating the likelihood, and I think the reason they're approximately accurate in those expectations is because we're not seeing any of that, right? There's no amendments. There's no discussion. There's no obvious updating of all the prospectuses at once to answer the same questions. There's just none of the indicia. Um, There's general now, indifference from the SEC. Yeah, or, or they're, they're listening, like they're in listening mode. They're meetings with the SEC and you see them listening and they did that with Bitcoin for years, but there's no, there's no two-way flow. Uh, and that's really what you wanna see. That doesn't mean it's impossible. We're not yet in the window where it's impossible. If this were still true in late April, we'd be in the window where it's impossible, right? They just can't move that fast. At this point, it's still theoretically possible. That's why it's 35 and not zero, but it's trending down because we haven't yet seen this in the public filings. My view is that ultimately uh, we will get an Ethereum ETF. The, the core logic on which the Bitcoin ETF approval rests, which is that futures and spot track each other very well and are tightly correlated, applies into Ethereum. And to give kudos to um, a competitor, Fidelity recently updated their filing with some really good data demonstrating this. I think it's probably the best shot on goal that the ETH um, world has had for a Bitcoin ETF was the new Fidelity update. So I think we'll eventually get it. I would guess I'm over 50% by the end of this year. I think it's probable this year. And I'll add one more nuance and then I'll stop talking because I've been going on for a while. I'll let Ryan speak, poor guy over there. I think Ethereum ETFs will pull in more assets if they launch in December than if they launch in May. Hmm. I think TradFi is still in the process, as we discussed, of digesting this Bitcoin ETF, and they're not yet ready for the next asset. So I actually think the ETFs will be more successful at the end of the year than if they launch in May. Uh, and I think it's more likely we'll get a launch at the end of the year than we get a launch in May. So TradFi is just like currently reeling, overwhelmed from what's going on with the Bitcoin ETF, hasn't completely processed it, still digesting it. Uh, and so uh, it would be more bullish if we just sat on our hands as an industry and waited for them to like kind of catch up with the times uh, and then we can improve the ET, ETH ETF. Is that's, that's your most bullish uh, version of the future? That's my most bullish version of the future because Ryan can only do so many meetings and he still has to get through <laughs> his Bitcoin meetings before he can do his his Ethereum meetings. I mean, it, it's a joke, but it's true. So I do think I do think if these launch at the end of the year and we've you know, we've had Denkun and we've started to see the applications bubble up and we're getting those real world applications and user counts are growing. I think it's a perfect scenario for for ETH. Of course, the sooner we get it in some way, the better. But I, I, I do think there's a bullish case to be made for end of the year. Bitwise, Ryan, tell us about your perspective on just the conversations around ETH and the, and the ETH ETF as the, as the resident boots on the ground here. Yeah, I think that's right. You don't want to overwhelm these advisors with choices. You have to think about, even though we're talking about and researching and, and on Twitter, talking about Ethereum every single day and talking about crypto every single day, these investors spend a very small percentage of their time actually thinking about crypto actually thinking about investing in it they're over there trying to grow assets it's really a business development business when you're in the in, in the world of managing assets and you're just trying to find clients who want to entrust you with their assets and then you go and invest them and if you're only investing one percent of your portfolio or five percent of your portfolio into crypto you're spending less than that thinking about uh, those assets as a whole because you're spending most of your time thinking about marketing and growing your business and so i think if they let them get their arms around bitcoin when we go back to to denver when i was in the room with that large ria almost every single question was about bitcoin it was and they weren't deep down the rabbit hole around bitcoin we were still getting questions that says how do we know that bitcoin isn't a ponzi scheme how do you know they can't increase the supply to more than 21 million <laughs> right and these are questions that we've maybe all grappled with our first Satoshi's just going to come and dump it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so so then you try to tell them, okay, look, that's the whole the whole case around Bitcoin is it's limited supply. 
increasing demand. It's a it's a commodity similar to gold. Then you try to explain Ethereum, which is this decentralized version of the internet where all these crazy crypto applications are going to be built on top of it. They don't really know how to think about that. And when they're trying to allow the Bitcoin brain drain to come in, it's really difficult to also have the this new internet come in, DeFi, crypto applications. And so I think that conversation coming later would help, like Matt said, allow them to get some exposure to Bitcoin first, let that settle, let them talk to their clients about it, have some of their quarterly meetings or biannual meetings that they have with their clients to go over their portfolios, get them used to, to Bitcoin. And then the next best thing comes up, which is Ethereum. And they can then have that opportunity to say, look, we carved off some of your inflation hedge and we put it into Bitcoin. What if now we carve off some of your technology sleeve, maybe some of your, your NASDAQ sleeve and put that into Ethereum, which is a tech version kind of of the crypto ecosystem. In our job here, uh, Ryan and Matt, j j just so it's clear, is when that time comes to make sure that there are some uh, bankless listeners implanted in the audience. You talked about those Bitcoin fanatics. We want some Ethereum fanatics in the audience uh, who are allocated to Ether to speak up for it and to explain it to to their colleagues. That's what we're, we're, we're here to do. Um, Matt, I want to ask you about your percentages. So uh, understand, um, like you're, you're, uh, not predicting may right now is you don't think that's going to happen. So you, you think maybe the, the 35% is uh, along the lines of accurate, unless we see some real activity in April, but you still, uh, give it over 50% probability for the year, maybe toward, uh, the, the end of the year. And I want to ask you about sort of the, like the, the, the pro side, the, the likelihood that it happens versus the, the, the kind of the against side. So on, on the pro side, a few, um, like pieces, like facts, uh, I guess I would say, or, or things of interest. And I'm wondering how you weight these. One is that BlackRock wants it. And so one thing that we used to say <laughs> in uh, 2023 is what BlackRock wants, BlackRock gets. And that's probably a, like kind of a binary uh, way of understanding it. But uh, it's no small thing to have a BlackRock filing and their filings have proven uh, very successful over time. They usually don't lose and so this would be in the camp that, hey, BlackRock is behind this. They definitely want this. So how can the SEC say no at this point? Another uh, fact that I'll uh, enter in, in, into the matter is uh, th there have been ongoing court cases. So it seemed like the um, the grayscale win for uh, where, where the, the I believe the court called um, the SEC's action arbitrary and capricious, which is a just brilliant line. We could apply that in many in, in many uh, SEC decisions. Don't comment on that. Of course, you guys are in the filing process. That that was me saying that. Um, so, like court cases could come up against the SEC if they if they do decide to reject uh, an Ethereum ETF in May. Like, what reason do they have to reject that when we have a trust out here and um, uh, Ether E Trust from, from from Grayscale as well? So, some of these things factor in. I think at least they weight highly in my mind. Do they actually make a difference? Is this uh, more a, a force to the the pro that we'll get an Ethereum ETF by the end of the year? Yeah, I think the lawsuit makes a lot of difference. And I love the words arbitrary and capricious. I, I should like get a couple dogs and name them. That. <laughs> um, I think it's wonderful. Uh, so, so I think the lawsuit is is real because it did establish um, that if you have a futures based ETF, which we do in ETH, and if the futures are highly correlated with spot, that it's very difficult not to allow a spot ETF. It's not impossible. Right, there are differences around ETH, um, but it's very, very difficult. We have and I those think things. Yes, we have those things absolutely, and the data is very convincing. And uh, the ETH futures market is very liquid, and the correlations are arguably even tighter than they are in Bitcoin. So it's it's a very compelling case, and I ultimately do think that will be the winning argument. And that's why I don't think we need a regime change to get an Ethereum ETF because I think that's established. It's also the case that there is then a nice dividing line where um, where they don't need to go any further because there are no futures on other assets. There's futures on Bitcoin and ETH. And so it's not like they're opening the floodgate gates to, you know, meme coin ETFs. That's not the case. They're doing the two blue cap assets and they're letting people gain exposure to them. And so I think that will matter. I think the other thing that matters is that the ETFs have worked so well. They've worked perfectly. They've lowered the cost for investors by 90%. They've raised security. Uh, they've um, improved trading and liquidity. 
And the SEC is supposed to consider that in its reviews as well. So those are the big things. I don't put too much into the BlackRock piece. Um, you know, that's a correlation causation thing. You could also argue that they only file when things look promising. Um, I don't think they have any sort of magic inside sauce, but I think the lawsuit thing and the investor protection thing um, mean we will get them. I just think the SEC can take its time. Okay, so um, now I'm going to yeah. ask you to take the other side of that argument. So if we don't mm -hmm. get the Ethereum ETF by the end of the year, why won't we get it? I think some have uh, uh, po pointed out um, uh, political pressure being a reason. I'm sure no one in the SEC would ever acknowledge this. They are, you know, purely merit based, aren't they? And but but um, you know, some <laughs> have pointed to kind of like the political anti crypto army maybe uh, playing a role here, uh, indicating that there was some political cost for uh, regu various regulators uh, approving this this nasty um, crypto asset, this nasty Bitcoin thing. And uh, I'm wondering if that factors in, or if not that, then what other factors would um, like create conditions where we don't have an Ethereum ETF by the end of 2024? I think the anti-crypto army is a lot sc less scary now than it was a year ago. Uh, there's been a lot of desertions from that army. It's now sort of five people waving ratty flags into the wind. So I wouldn't worry too much about the political pressure, uh, at least not as much as I would in the past. I do think from the SEC's perspective, allowing an ETH ETF sort of recrosses that line of ETH is definitively not a security. Um, and they've been uncomfortable with that uh, post Hinman, right? The Hinman, Hinman said it was not a security. Gensler has been unclear on that. And there'd be some sort of re-endorsement of its status as a uh, non-security by the SEC that I think I think they may be uncomfortable. Again, I think that's the minor, I don't think that's going to happen. But if if it did happen, I think that would be the behind the scenes reason. That wouldn't be the explicit reason. The explicit reason would be something to do with, you know, data quality or data history or liquidity or something like that. But I think behind the scenes, what what they would be wanting not to do is establish that precedent if uh, if they didn't allow it, you know, within the next 12 months. To be clear, the industry is ready for this now, right? At least from kind of the industry side, if they approved in May, we would be good to go. Absolutely. These ETFs would work perfectly. Again, they would lower costs. Again, they would improve security for many investors and improve access. So um, it would be a win for American investors and a win for American technology and a win for America if they approved it. And I think eventually they will. I just don't know if they'll be quite ready yet. We talked about the uh, Bitcoin ETF kind of aging like wine, and there's this extra nuance in the ETH ETF that um, it actually has its own endogenous reason why it would improve over time. And that's because I think in the fullness of time, we will see staking be a part of the Ethereum ETF. Uh, and so in addition to all the regular TradFi just needs to absorb it, comprehend it, figure out how to filter it out to all of its like distribution arms, which are the, like, the brokerages, uh, the advisors, et cetera. There's also the evolution Evolution of the ETH, ETH ETF itself, I would assume, would start at the vanilla ETH asset and then evolve into a staked ETH asset in the fullness of time. Uh, do you, Matt, do you, do you agree that this is like the long term conclusion of the ETH ETF just to really start this conversation? 100%. That's exactly right. And you're right. It will probably start without staking. And you're right that it will add it over time. Uh, that's what investors want. And is that like a trivial evolution or is this going to take like another number of years in order to get like the SEC and regulators and just people on board with this? So I don't I don't know is the answer, but I'd be surprised if it was years. Year, a year seems like a more reasonable number, right? Um, they're, they're certain to not certain. They're likely to go with the simplest version first because that's what you do when you're getting something new out the door. Think of it as an MVP of an ETF, right? It's a minimum viable product. Um, I don't think it's that far of a leap to staking and you can see it used in other markets around the world. But I, I do think it's, you know, it's a year, it's 18 months, it's something on ta that timeline, if I were forced to guess. I would just add to that, I think an analogy you can make here with the vanilla and then getting more complex from there is other ETFs that initially launch, whether it's Bitcoin ETFs or simple ETFs, that you then have short or inverse ETFs launched that are focused on those products. You then have leveraged ETFs launched that are focused on those products. And so you tend to always have this kind of simple approach first, and then you get more complex out there. And so while staking is a little bit more complicated than just creating a leveraged or inverse ETF, I wouldn't be so shocked that we see the ability to have a staked Ethereum ETF in the future. It's 
kicking a dividend down to the investors ultimately, which again is good for the investors. And as, as long as you disclose the risks in the in the uh, fund prospectus and all of that documents, really it's up to the investor to make that decision. And the SEC shouldn't be uh, playing gatekeeper when it comes to that. And so I think we'll eventually get there, but definitely we'll have that vanilla uh, ETH ETF before we have anything. Man, Ryan, I think you just opened up like a whole entire like rabbit hole of like ETF permutations, ETF derivatives. Uh, like what what kind of like spark our imaginations here? What kind of uh, other types of crypto ETFs, merely even just off the Bitcoin or the ETH assets? Uh, what what types would you expect to see emerge on the floor like sooner rather than later? I think if you have if you look at the futures ETFs, we had Bitcoin futures ETFs, we had Ethereum futures ETFs. Then you have maybe 50 50 uh, ETH futures and Bitcoin futures ETFs that just split it down the middle so that with the purchase of one share of an ETF, you have 50% exposure to Bitcoin, you have 50% exposure to Ethereum. You could have that as a market weighted ETF, or you know, you could have some sort of moving average built into that fund where it trades in and out of one and into the other based on moving averages. Uh, we also will have options for these for the Bitcoin ETF soon, which will unlock an entirely new uh, category of demand and, and traders and you know, call it Wall Street bets or just institutions that love that love buying and selling options. I think that'll bring new demand into the market. And so uh, covered call strategies, ETFs will emerge and uh, all kinds of fun things like that. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens to uh, inverse Bitcoin ETFs when those when those hit the market. Beautiful. Uh, I want to get back into some more questions about just the nature of the, the ETH ETF. Um, I know this is like starting to get into like some fog of war stuff. We just don't really have too many answers or clarity here. But Matt, any insight on like how the staking mechanism would actually work inside of a staked ETH ETF? Is this like, what's the most likely outcome here? Like ETH is just basically going to be staked by Coinbase. Is this going to be like a Lido staked ETH denominated ETF? Like, do you have any sort of insight as to how the yield actually gets into an ETF? Really complex question, made more complex by the fact that the structure of these ETFs is something called a grantor trust, which you, you can sort of think of as a box that doesn't want to do anything. All grantor trusts want to do is just sort of sit there. And so making a grantor trust do something like stake ETH is complex. I think it's liable to be at the custodial level. Um, uh, that's the most likely outcome is is uh is sort of through the custodial level the analogy for what it's worth there is an analogy in traditional equity etfs so what many traditional equity etfs do that hold like tesla stock or apple stock etc is they actually lend that stock out to short sellers and earn a yield on it um and that's typically done you know through the issuer through the custodian and i think the similar model will will apply here but we don't know for sure yet and then the the last question, and I think is like the most important question about this whole ETF thing uh, when it comes to ETH is, of course, the price impact on it. Um, ETH is, of course, one third of the market cap of Bitcoin. Uh, it also has less ETH on, mar on secondary markets simply because there's plenty of ETH in DeFi, plenty of ETH on layer twos, plenty of ETH in eigenlayer. Um, uh, do you have any sort of notion as to like how the relative price impact would be on Ether, uh, on an Ether ETF in comparison to what we've seen in the Bitcoin ETF? Do you have any sort of commentary on this, Matt? It's a great question. You know, look, I think ETH ETFs will gather billions of dollars of long-term capital that buys it and holds it. And um, ETH market cap is not that large. So over time, I think the impact could be really significant. Um, I still don't think, right now, I'm not sure that the ETF tail is what's wagging the Ethereum dog. I, I really still think it's the use cases and the technological progress, which has been massive and overwhelming. And maybe I'm just so bullish on the growth of those things that I think that that's more important than the ETF. I think of the ETF as like a nice, important catalyst that will impact price. Future catalyst, not current catalyst. Future catalyst that will impact price. But ETH has other really important catalysts, almost in a way that Bitcoin doesn't, right? Bitcoin has the halving uh, but the the ETF was really important for Bitcoin because it's fundamentally a store of value and that's its use case. Ethereum has so many use cases and the technological story is so good right now and the, the app development is so exciting right now that I think that's, you know, that's probably the primary driver. But look, it'll be billions of dollars. Uh, it'll it'll impact price. I'm, I'm really bullish on ETH. Okay, so Bitcoin is uh, fifty billion uh, right now, and we're, ex we're expecting maybe by the end of the year it could f uh, it could flip gold. 
Um, what do we think if we got, got an Ethereum ETF? Do you, do you think it would be comparable to that? Do you think it would be smaller? You know, some, some have described this as sort of the, it, it's, it's more like the o- like opener, right? Um, and whereas like um, people people go to the concert for for Bitcoin, and you know, this is just kind of a side act, right? And it's not going to accrue the nearly the interest that um, the Bitcoin ETF would. And, and they point to I think the Ethereum futures, which are uh, have been fairly paltry to this point. Uh, wh- what do you think of that argument, uh, Matt? And w- what are your expectations for a future Ethereum ETF? They'll be way more successful than the Ethereum futures ETFs were, which were very disappointing. Those launched at a nadir in the market in a period of disinterest, um, and they were rushed to market. So I don't know that that's a good analogy. I don't think they'll be out of the gate as big as Bitcoin, but I think you know they'll attract billions of dollars in their first year. Um, that's my guess. I also think they'll have a slower ramp um, in terms of their their terminal flows will be more upward sloping because there's more education around Ethereum than there is around Bitcoin. Um, But I think it'll be billions of dollars. Look, I think they'll be very successful. And you'll have BlackRock and you'll have Bitwise and you'll have others talking about Ethereum and real world use cases. I think it'll be broadly additive for the space. But I I don't think it'll be, you know, $50 billion in year one. Um, You know, it'll be billions. It'll be a success. Ryan, you're on the front lines of institutional education here, and you've certainly been doing uh, your share of education around around Bitcoin. I, I'm uh, not sure what narrative is sticking the most, but if I had to guess, it'd be like, you know, store value, hedge against uh, the dollar. We've talked about some of those things here. Digital gold, uh, that seems to be a, a lasting meme that you can kind of transport. Um, how do you think the Ethereum narrative will will land among that that crowd? Like, what words will you use? What um, analogies? What what narratives do you think are are the stickiest for for that tribe? I think you got to look at it like a technology investment that that tends to resonate the most with the advisors that we're talking about when we when we explain what Ethereum is. We don't get so into the weeds of it's a blockchain that's decent that's a decentralized database that allows anyone to build. You know any kind of decentralized application with smart contracts you kind of you kind of zoom out and you say look this is a new technology platform that's going to fundamentally change the way that we interact with each other that companies interact with their customers and that we interact with data and value online in a way that bitcoin just today can't touch and when you talk about it like that and then you get into things like emerging ai and other kind of technology uh, narratives that are emerging it, blockchains don't seem that crazy and ethereum doesn't seem that crazy and the more it becomes a household name the more that people are talking about that as they talk about bitcoin when they go on cnbc or fox business news the more that word ethereum comes into the the mainstream and the the minds of investors and and really you just need to educate them on the potential use cases on top of ethereum if you have this decentralized internet look what look what you could do with stable coins like what you can do with things like Farcaster or prediction markets. And that starts to really get the wheels turning in their head of, oh man, if I could have invested in the internet in the 90s or in the early 2000s, what what would that have looked like for my portfolio, for my clients' portfolios? And maybe it's not so crazy to carve off a bigger part of your technology sleeve to invest in Ethereum than what you're doing with your alt sleeve to invest in Bitcoin. And that's where I think we'll really start to see the demand for Ethereum ETFs when they launch is, okay, now this thing's real. We have an ETF around it that is uh, issued by some of the largest asset managers in the world. And if I invest in that ETF, I have exposure to this new technology platform where there's thousands of developers and millions of users and thousands of applications being launched and being used every single day. And all I have to do is buy this one asset, invest in this one asset. I don't have to pick the individual winners. It's kind of a, it's an index on that future growth of the crypto ecosystem beyond just a store of value. And I think when you talk about it like that, you start to see them really, you know, start to turn turn the page on what's possible with this technology. You don't have to understand everything it does and everything that will happen on it to know that it will have a fundamental impact on the way that we interact with technology in the future. And that's really the best the best selling point that I've seen resonate when I'm talking to advisors and, and walking them through it. Okay, so you're basically saying this is a piece of the the internet, maybe the decentralized internet. That that's part of the narrative. When it comes to valuation, though, do they think about this as like a tech play, like similar to maybe a you know an Amazon a high growth tech stock, or like how do you talk about valuation? I'm wondering if um, specifically the 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 meme that uh, we've been working on that some others have been kind of working on for for narrative understanding is like the internet bond, right? This thing does have a yield. It is sort of a share of uh, the internet. Do you think that that has a chance or is that is that too far? Is that a bridge too far, Ryan? No, I think that has a chance. We kind of talk about it in two ways. We say, look, 
In some ways, when there's more and more activity on this network, you start to have this burn mechanism, which acts a lot like a share buyback, right? And traditional investors can understand share buybacks. The largest companies in the world spend billions of dollars buying their shares off the market to reduce the flow and to reduce the supply. And you have the same thing happening when ETH is being burned, when when usage goes up. So we talk about there's value accrual from the fact that you have this burn mechanism, which is very similar to a share buyback. And then we talk about the yield from staking, which is very similar to a dividend. And when you put it into analogies they can understand that are very similar to investment in dividend stocks or in stocks that do share buybacks, they can really start to see how value will start to accrue to the underlying asset. And so an internet bond is a great way to think about it. I think simpler terms, uh, for for financial advisors who really think about things from a from a cash flow value accrual dividend perspective also works. Does the one two punch of a asset that has a native stock buyback component to it that is also yielding uh, dividends at the same time? Because like both of these things are great in silo, but the cool thing about ETH is that you get both. You get a deflationary asset that's also producing yield. Does that one two punch land, or uh, how do people react to that? I think that one-two punch lands. It's kind of like the setup for the haymaker, which is then when you show them the revenue that Ethereum's generating, it's billions of dollars in revenue every single year. And so I think those three things together, it's like, sure, great, there's a buyback and, and sure, there's a dividend, but where's all that actually coming from and what's going to make that happen? You say, well, look, there, here's thousands of applications, here's millions of users, here's billions in revenue being generated on this platform then they then they have that aha moment and they really start to understand this isn't going away it's only going to get bigger and i should have some exposure to this on behalf of my clients what we're really asking for, uh, you for ryan is that you would take uh, david and myself on the road with you so we can you know like ha help fight the good fight and, and convince some folks uh, matt what, what would you add to this discussion around kind of narratives and pos positioning of uh, ether the asset for the institutional tribe yeah, I think I think you all have touched it really well. I mean, the beautiful thing about that buyback and dividend thing is it puts it into familiar ground, right? It makes it just like a, a stock and it makes it like an early stage technology investment, which all of these people are used to. Uh, and that just makes it very comfortable. There is a set of institutional investors who will never be comfortable with Bitcoin because it doesn't have those characteristics. And this makes Ethereum very comfortable for them. I'd also add that, you know, most of these people are 45, 50, 60 years old, and they experienced the rise of the internet from something that was weird and quirky and no one used to something that they use every day. And so this is a narrative that fits in their mind with historical patterns. And I think that's really valuable as well. Those analogies really work uh, with this audience. Guys, this has been fantastic. And maybe I'll close this out with a final question. So we, we are maybe in the in the first inning of the institutional uh, adoption, let's say, of, of crypto. And, and maybe I'll put some milestones or benchmarks behind that. First inning is Bitcoin ETF approved, right? Second inning is uh, Ethereum ETF approved, which of course is uh, you know like most famous for its uh, tokenization and smart contract capabilities. What is the third inning of this thing? Uh, Larry Fink has talked about um, tokenization. As, as one of the things, I don't know if this is implying real world assets on chain or, or what that is, but after the Ethereum ETF, what do you think is next on this roadmap of uh, TradFi adoption of crypto? Mm, I want to hear Ryan go first, then I'll, 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 I'll add mine. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, certainly the real world asset tokenization narrative, it, I really see that resonate when I'm talking to institutional investors because they can understand the concept of just wrapping uh, some kind of structured product around something that already exists. So for them, you think about tokenized real world asset on chain, that's kind of like taking a on chain asset like Bitcoin or Ethereum and wrapping an ETF wrapper and bringing it onto the the rails of traditional finance. And so that really resonates with them. So I think real world assets will be a big boost, and not only because it brings efficiencies into a market that's inefficient and that's opaque and not very transparent, but because you're seeing these large asset managers like JP Morgan and like Franklin Templeton experiment with tokenizing real world assets. And I think that's what gives them that stamp of approval or that conviction that, hey, this is real technology, it could really have a difference in the world. And if institutions like JP Morgan, if institutions like Franklin Templeton are really starting to invest resources into bringing assets on chain, then there must be value on chain that we can go after. And so I think real old assets will be huge. I mean, we have the continued growth of stable coins. We've already seen stable coin transaction volume in 2023 
hit about 67% or 60% or so of Visa's total payment volumes in 2023. So we're seeing this like crazy emergence of stable coins, which is a, another use case. We're seeing this emergence of real world assets, which is now a billion or multi-billion dollar market. I think just more and more of these use cases that pop up and have real traction in the world will just bring advisors into the, the concept of investing in assets that are on chain and investing in the underlying infrastructure. Good answer. Uh, he pit touched on what I was going to say, which is I think massive uh, mainstreaming of stable coins is inning number three. And I think from two perspectives, both from a, a payments perspective locally, and then a US bank account in every pocket around the world perspective globally. And I think the massive mainstreaming of stable coins is sort of the last hook that we need uh, before crypto and blockchain completely reinvents the financial ecosystem. So Bitcoin ETF, ETH ETF, stable coins everywhere, and then we'll get tokenization and real world assets. You want to call a timeline on that, Matt? Are we uh, a couple years out or is this going to take uh, <laughs> longer than that? Uh, I think stable coins are probably this cycle where they really start to go mainstream and tokenization is probably the, the, the final cycle, which is the next one. That would be my guess. But I think stable coins could 10x from here from an AUM perspective by the end of 2025. I really think the growth could be um, off the hook. Matt, you're at uh, DAS right now is the conference that you're at. Uh, just really quickly, give us the lay of the land. Like what's going on over there? What's the sentiment like? Yeah, huge bull market, early bull market vibes. Uh, two things stand out to me. Um, I mean, one, it's it's sold out. It's oversubscribed to give you a feel for the bull market vibes. It's much more institutional than any crypto conference I've been to in the past. And the quality of projects are exceptional. There's still some discussion of sort of the fun aspects of crypto, but there are serious people building real world projects. I'm more bullish coming from this conference than I have been um, at any conference I've gone to for the past three or four years. Uh, really suggests that the industry has made a big step forward. Oh, yeah. Well, if that's an early stage bull market conference, then at Permissionless in six months in October, uh, man, that mania is going to be uh, pretty, pretty well crescendoed <laughs> by then. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there. Yeah, 100%. Uh, for looking the Bankless Nation, it. as always, we'll include a link in the show notes where you can get a discount on those permissionless tickets if you want to join us all. And got to end with this. Some spectacular news, I think, for you. There is still some time to front run the opportunity. The institutions are coming, but they're not all here. Got to end with this, of course, some more. Uh, sobriety injected in the podcast toward the end crypto is risky you could lose what you put in but we are headed west this is the frontier it's not for everyone but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey thanks a lot 